All right, well, welcome everybody today, and thank you for coming up to our second session. Um, we've been having a really good month or so, so far, and uh, have a lot of good feedback, and it's been really great to see the community uh, emails going back and forth, kind of some of the competition that's going on. Um, so tonight's speaker is Dave Bizanko. I'll let him give a little more on his old bio and, and where he's at now. Uh, I can say that he's a very inspiring spinning uh, instructor for me for uh, a year or two. Uh, that really did change the way that I think about fitness and the way that I think about long-term um, heart health. So uh, I'm really excited to see you tonight, and I really hope you guys enjoy the <coughs> session. So, uh, Thank you very much, Rachel. This is actually just <laughs> that's not supposed to happen. No. Um, so the first thing we're going to do tonight is we do have this new piece of software that uh, we're going to be using uh, during tonight's presentation. It's called Presentain, and I've just learned one new thing about this presentation software, and that is um, I get a new access code every time I log in. So those of you who are logged in right now, we may have to use another login number. So just give me one second. Oh, they didn't yeah. ask you for a login. They just told me to. I apologize for this. We're just going to put in the server. I thought it was going to be on hold, but it's not going to do that. So Okay, so actually it should work because you're still in the same URL. All right. So, can everybody on their smartphones right now see the presentation screen that's on? Yes. Yeah. Again, excellent. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to have a little bit of fun. We're going to start recording the session. So those of you who would like to have this session afterwards, uh, it'll be available for download uh, for free. You'll be able to share it with your friends and family. Uh, for those people who are remote today, they'll be able to type in their questions and ask questions remotely, which will be really good as well. Um, and we can also do some live polls. So right now we're going to start our first live poll, and we're just going to start right now and show the chart. So is the poll showing up on your phones right now? Yes. yes. And what is the question it's asking you? Do you want more health and happiness in your life? Okay, it's a yes or no question. Really easy. So really quickly, just make your selection, and we'll see what comes up on the chart. Do you want to run? Yeah, it's not I hit submit. It won't submit. It's not submitting? No. No, yeah, I hit the submit button. All right. <laughs> First technical glitch. We're going to get in the poll. There we go. There we go. All right. Okay, <laughs> so moving on. Moving on. Um, okay, so we're going to skip the live polling part because obviously that part's not working. But, so my understanding is this is sort of a beginning of a year-long uh, wellness challenge for your company, which is awesome. What I asked Rachel to you know, inform me about is sort of where you are in your journey. So my understanding is you're about a month in, and last month you probably had uh, somebody come in to talk about nutrition. So now that you've learned the evils of sugar, and you should only be eating fruits and vegetables and lean proteins, who here is ready to chew their arm off? <laughs> Dan's being honest. All right, I'm good for Dan. The only thing I'm finding is uh, I'm eating a lot of chicken, but it's still a lot of uh, sodium. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of sodium intake. So that's something that we can talk about later on in the program, and I'll, I'll definitely address those issues for you. Um, but what we, what we typically see when we start this journey on health and wellness is we tend to, to get a lot of information from us. So what if I were to ask you? What if everything you thought you knew about diet and exercise might actually be not right or, or incomplete? Would you agree with that statement? And what if I asked you everything that you thought about health and happiness might be maybe not right or incomplete? Would you agree with that statement? What's that? Yes. So what we found is that in life, we have, and in fitness and in health, we have all of these Bits and pieces of information, especially with the internet today. We've just got so much information at our fingertips. Can anybody tell me what this represents? 
Rachel might be the only person that might know what this is, because maybe we've drilled this in here before, but does anybody know what this is without looking it up online? Carbon this is assuming it's about oxygen and something else. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's a great starting point. This, so is actually, yeah. this is actually the chemical makeup of a fat cell. Oh, nice. Okay. All right, so here's a quick question. Fun fact. Does anybody know how fat actually goes from here out of our body? PDP, I don't know. That's one answer. There's only two ways. Oddly enough, oddly enough, there's more than two ways. Can we sweat it? Can we sweat it out? Can we sweat it out? Can we sweat it out? Sweat it out. That's, that's, that's that's another common response. Metabolizing. Well, metabolizing is part of the process. But what actually happens is fat is exhaled out as CO2. So 84% of that fat cell, once it starts metabolizing, once you start getting biochemistry happening, it actually becomes carbon dioxide. Only 16% is excreted from the body. Okay. Okay. As, as H2O. So that's, this is a fun fact that the people don't know about alpha wellness. Let's try another fun fact. Glycogen. Does anybody here know what glycogen is? So as an athlete, you know that when you are exercising, you have fuel in your body. It's, it's the sugar that's running through your veins that, that uh, fuels exercise as you go. Uh, was it Tour de France? What's his name? Did the and Armstrong? Armstrong? It had something to do with the VO2 uh, max input, yes. Uh, he was blood doping, which is a whole other <laughs> conversation. But glycogen is basically what is available as a fuel source for your muscles to work as you're moving throughout your day. So what most people don't stop to consider when they're thinking about diet and exercise is how we get rid of that glycogen? We think if I exercise that I'm immediately going to start burning fat for fuel if I'm in the right, say, heart rate zone, for example. But there's three different types of... There, there's three different um, types of intensity for exercise. There's subaerobic, aerobic, and anaerobic. Okay? And in a subaerobic activity, something like going for a nice leisurely walk or riding your bike in a nice leisurely way, it would take about 90 minutes of exercise before all that glycogen would be gone until your body is going, hey, I need to fuel myself, how am I going to do that? If you were doing something like going for a run or maybe riding your bike at, say, 30 kilometers an hour or an hour at a time, um, you would take about 40 minutes until you got to that point where your body went, okay, I'm not a fuel source, what am I going to consume now? And if you were doing something like interval training, it would take about uh, 20 minutes to get through that glycogen before again it's looking for an ultimate fuel source. The thing about the high intensity training is that typically you don't do a hip workout for longer than 20 minutes. It's sort of a, a self-limiting activity. You can only go so hard for so long, right? So these are some fun facts that aren't normally discussed when we talk about diet and exercise. The last thing I want to talk about is heart rate zones because does anybody here understand the relationship between your heart rate and how your body feeds itself when you're exercising? Blank stairs, excellent. <laughs> and that's what I expect because most people wouldn't connect these dots together. Um, what actually happens is when you're exercising, when you're exercising at a lower intensity, that going for a walk or for riding your bike lightly, basically your heart rate is below 60%. Most people when they're exercising um, do something called perceived exertion. They don't wear a heart rate monitor. They don't know where their heart rate actually is. Why that's important is because when your heart rate is in the fat burning zone, <coughs> okay, that's when your body will actually consume fat for fuel. If you're actually below that, you're not going to be consuming fat for fuel. And if you're above that, you're going to attack the muscle mass for fuel. So these are different considerations. Lots of good information, meaningless to a lot of people who aren't exercising for longer than an hour at a time. But the point is, there's a lot of information out there, and unless we communicate with ourselves and understand exactly what it is we're trying to accomplish throughout this competition, I want to help you today try to put these things into sort of clearer perspective. So a lot of people ask me all the time, what works best? What's the best exercise to do? And quite frankly, I tell them whatever makes your heart sing. Now, Rachel, in her introduction, told you a little bit about my background and where I came from, but 40, well, 11 years ago when I was 40, um, I had a heart scare. And I'll go into that story in a little bit more detail, but I became an Ironman triathlete because it was something that never was going to be on my radar. Um, and, and people ask me all the time, what do you love to do? I love to swim, bike, and run. Uh, it wasn't what I started doing when I started my journey, but my journey continued to evolve over the course of the last 11 years. So when I talk to people about exercise, they say, do what makes your heart sing, because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to do it very long. 
If it seems torturous, you probably won't do it. But if you love it, keep doing it. What I would recommend not doing is something that this gentleman might be doing. This to me reminds me when I was 40 and I was a weekend warrior, and I won't do this stuff in weekends. And what you're doing is you're stressing your heart. Right? You're sprinting, you're stopping. You're sprinting, you're stopping. There's a reason why they put the fibrillators in the locker rooms. Mm -hmm. Right? For old guys like me who think they're still in high school and go out and they stress their hearts. So when people ask about exercise, I say you need to do what makes your heart sing, but you need to pay attention to what you're doing while you're doing it. And I'll get into some more details about that in a minute. Now, let's talk about some fun facts about food. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? Probably not, but this is Dr. Howard Moskowitz. Uh, he is a mathematician at Harvard University, and over the course of his 40-year career, he created something called the Bliss Point. He's known as Dr. Bliss. You can look that up on the internet. Uh, wonderful place. But over his course, course of 40 years, what Dr. Moskowitz did was he helped the food industry perfect the reason why we're all addicted to processed foods. He is a mathematician by nature, and he actually the food industry has come to him and they say, okay, here's our latest, greatest food. Can you please put in the right amount, figure out the quotient for the right amount of salt, so, sorry, sodium, sugar, and fat, so that it's got a uh, stable shelf life, and it becomes highly addictive to our customers. So that's actually a thing. It's not your fault if you've been addicted to processed foods like I've been. Does anybody feel like they've been addicted to processed foods their entire life? They, my dad sold chips for a living. <laughs> like, come on. Um, I had the keys to the candy store for a and, and I'm still addicted to those foods, and I've got strategies for not uh, having them in my home, which is how I avoid eating them, because when they're in my home, it's like a siren calling me, right? Um, there is no off time for that addiction. So I'll, I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail, but but this this is something that is very important that most people don't realize about food. You think that it's your fault that you're addicted. Now, Coca-Cola is a great example. Coca-Cola, when they first made it with the original recipe, was made with cocaine. So, okay, so um, it became a very highly addictive product. The food, the food and uh, Drug Administration at the time came in and said, no, you can't give that to people. <laughs> so what did they do? What did they do? They replaced it with something that's eight times as addictive as cocaine. Sugar is eight times as addictive as cocaine. But the problem is, with cocaine, you can see the obvious side effects almost immediately. right? And when we see somebody who's got a drug addiction, what do we do? We get them help. We take them to rehab. We do an intervention, we do all these wonderful things. But that's because the, the problem is obvious. With food addiction and with sugar, it's not so obvious. It takes centuries, it takes decades to get to the point where all of a sudden there's chronic disease in fight. And then people point fingers at you and they go, hey, it's your fault, right? You don't have to control your eating. It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> So what you have to understand, and I want you to understand, this whole talk about search for health and happiness is all around uh, your mental perspective and how you think about this journey that you're going to be going on. So I just want you to understand that there's a lot of information out there that you don't know yet, and if you become a lifelong learner and continue to ask better questions, which we'll talk about, you're going to discover more facts. And the problem with that is it becomes even more confusing. Because the more information you have, the more views you get, and then it gets really super frustrating. So I'm going to show you some techniques that are going to help you sort of solve that problem today. So people ask me, oh, it, 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 uh, eight times it didn't, that slide didn't pop up when I was. Oh, it didn't? Okay. No, I'm just Thank you for sharing. No, 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 thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that was just a glitching system. My first time using this picker system, so <laughs> bear with me. But again, most people ask me what the best type of food is. So you had a nutritionist come in and talk to you, and I would have probably assume that what he told you was that you want to eat nutritionally dense food, right? That means natural food. That means organic raw food if you eat it. And if you're going to eat it processed, lightly processed. You know, the more you process, think about a head of broccoli. When you cook a head of broccoli, uh, if you overcook it, it becomes mushy. Right? You've broken down the fibrous nature that actually helps you to digest it and slows down the release of sugar in the body. So all of these carbohydrates have sugar in them, just like your highly processed carbohydrates have sugar in them. But if it's still in its natural state, it takes longer to digest. It has a slower insulin response when it goes to your body. Again, I'm sure the nutritionist went through all that with you, but the point is, the best type of diet is a natural diet. Get you know 80% of the foods that you're eating from natural sources. Um, fun fact about meat, uh, I'm still a meat eater, although I do really 
try to avoid a lot of meat. So I eat maybe mm, four ounces of meat at a meal tops. And, and what I've learned about meat is it's not necessarily the meat that's bad, but it's the omega-3s or the omega-6s that might be in the meat. And that's from the, the actual animal's fuel source. So when you think about food, you know, if you're going to eat some meat, it might be your best interest to eat grain-fed meat because grain-fed is getting the omega-3s, whereas your corn-fed animals who are pumped up and, and sent to the grocery stores are getting the omega-6s, which causes inflation, inflammation in your body. So again, what I want you to understand is when you're seeing information online, because this will be a lifelong journey for you, you need to be able to be able to interpret the information that you're seeing and have some good perspective. So when people ask me about food, I say eat whole foods, eat a little bit of meat, try to avoid a lot of red meat if you can, try to eat grain fed because it's simply better for you. It's not rocket science, it doesn't have to be rocket science. You don't have to count points, you don't have to. Now I know, I think, is everybody using MyFitnessPal? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I started using MyFitnessPal, it is awesome. If you don't have a handle on the way you consume food, it is an amazing tool to start journaling and you can actually select, so Jamie, you were saying uh, sodium is an issue. You can select sodium and you can see how much sodium you're taking in. Right? So it gives you that insight that you're looking for. I find I go back to it when I feel like my diet's getting a little crappy again, uh, because I've gotten to the point where I'm at a healthy weight, and you'll get there too. Or even if you are at a healthy weight, maybe it's other things in your diet you're trying to be aware of, things like sugar and how much and why. So this is what I use that tool for, to just make sure that I'm always sort of on the right path, because we're sort of creatures of habit. We start eating the same foods all the time. So we're either going to be on a, a diet plan that's going to take us away from where we want to be as we grow older, or it's going to take us in a different direction, right? So if diet and exercise aren't the cure, then maybe being naturally athletic is going to lead us to health and happiness as we get older. And you can see here Magic Johnson, Mike Tyson, Eric Lindros, probably three well-known names in this room, three guys who were elite athletes in the day, and we would argue that, well, if they were naturally athletic, they should probably have a wonderful life because they were older. Clearly, something's happening, right? They've got lots of money, they can experience lots of pleasure, but they've got a part of the equation wrong. Something's going definitely wrong with these guys. So if it's not naturally athletic that makes us healthy and happy as we grow older, well, maybe it's just being naturally skinny. You know, maybe that's the solution. Who here in the room knows anybody that is a naturally skinny person who's always on a diet and always fixated about their weight? Anybody? Just me then. <laughs> <laughs> I know lots of people who are like this, who they could sit down and have 10 meals a day, not don't get a pound. Um, a lot of yeah. Oh, well, oh, sorry. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, I know a lot of, a lot of people who have, and I would say there's a lot of mothers that I know who don't eat to maintain their weight, and they're teaching this to their daughters, and their daughters have learned the same thing, and they have eating disorders. When you have kids who are 20 and 24 years old, they start telling you what their friends are doing in the homes, and you get the real insights. And it's become a very interesting journey to start listening to them talk. And as I go through this process, you'll start to see that, yeah, there's some reoccurring patterns that happen all over the place because of misinformation. So if it's not food and exercise, if it's not uh, being natural athletic or, or being skinny by nature, maybe it's effort. Maybe if I go to the gym and I just work out like crazy, that's going to be the solution to health and happiness. Has anybody here ever joined a gym membership or had a gym membership and quit? Anybody? I know anybody has done that? Lots of us have, right? Why is that? Right? We, we have a certain expectation when we go to the gym. Expecting immediate results. You expect the immediate results. Everybody promises 10 pounds a month, or 20 in some cases. And if that doesn't happen, we start to get frustrated, right? And when we start getting frustrated, we start questioning, is this really worth it, right? And that's what I did in my 30s. I had gym memberships, I quit gym memberships. I had trainers, I quit the trainers. Because not one of them ever asked me what my vision was, where I wanted to go with my life. They just naturally assumed that somehow I wanted to have six-pack abs or that I needed to lose weight. And that was the wrong assumption, because that really wasn't where I was thinking. And they can help me develop that thought process. So what I'm here to tell you today is that perspective is everything. And the rest of this talk is going to be about having the right perspective so that you can enjoy more health and happiness in your life. And I will tell you, it is a puzzle. And the neat thing about this puzzle, it's a balance between food, sleep, exercise, and mental health. How you see yourself and how you communicate with yourself. But even more importantly, you need to understand that as I go through this, you're going to understand that your vision of yourself is going to continually change. I can tell you that 11 years ago, 
I had no intention of ever being an Ironman triathlete. And three finishes later, it's like, where did this person come from? And that's because my vision of what was possible in my life continually changed. And as that vision changes, so too will the pieces of the puzzle. It's kind of like having a jigsaw puzzle and not having a picture. You know it's going to be a neat picture when it's done, but you can't quite visualize it just yet. So this is some interesting science. Um, right now, with all the information that we have, obesity is on the rise, right? Smoking is on the rise. How can that possibly be? How can smoking be on the rise again and obesity be such a crisis when we have all this great information at our fingertips? And scientists right now are assuming and believing that it's this me too or no, no worse than anyone else attitude. That if I look around at my peer group and everybody else looks the same, then I feel good. And if we surround ourselves with people who are more closely to what we envision our lives being, all of a sudden our habits and our beliefs change. And there's some fears in there. Right? There's lost process and outcome fear that happen. If we make a bunch of changes, we fear that we're going to lose our favorite foods, maybe lose hanging out with our favorite friends. Uh, we might fear that the process itself is painful, and I may not see the results I'm looking for. And then we might fear that the outcome, if we do all this work and give up my foods, I might not see the outcome I'm looking for, so we quit. What I'm here to tell you today is that that kind of perspective is going to kill you. Sooner rather than later, it's going to create a lot of suffering. So my personal backstory, when I turned 40, that perspective always killed me. I weighed 220 pounds. I was driving uh, back from a hockey game in uh, Dunville with my son and one of the other hockey dads and his son. And, and I happened to say to Jim, I said, you know what? I've been experiencing chest pains and pains radiating me down my left arm for a while. I hear that's not a good thing. Um, so <laughs> in the car right back from Dunville, I said, you know what? I'm going to drop you guys off at home. And if you wouldn't mind just going and telling my wife, Rob, I'm, I'm driving myself over to the hotel, and I'm going to check myself and see what's what. Something was really off. And it had been off for a while, but it was just starting to sort of accumulate at this point. So I went to the emergency room, and immediately they took me into the cardiac ward, hooked me up to the, took my blood work, hooked me up to the APG machines, and there's four of us in the ward, all young guys, not saying a word to each other, all just these blind looks on their faces like, how the hell did we get here? We're like, this isn't supposed to be happening to us. And here we were. And the doctor came in and he gave me two choices. He says, Dave, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is you didn't have a heart attack today. We know that from the component levels in your blood. Bad news is you just about had one. You were very close. So you've got two choices. You can either go on heart and cholesterol medication for the rest of your life, or you can get in shape and lose some weight. Your choice. Off you go. Now, isn't that the advice that we often get from our doctors? Lose some weight and get in shape. Here's a piece of paper. Don't eat this. Go exercise. Worst advice in the world. We were talking about this earlier. Doctors are triage. They're here to put band-aids on solutions, and if you've got a specific problem, they send you off to somebody who's more specialized. The unfortunate part in all that is how many people walk away trying to figure this out on their own, and then they lean on the fitness industry, who is really in the business of making money. They're not in the business to necessarily see you be healthy. Yes, one or two, but there's a whole business model built around having people buy gym memberships and then making it really, really hard to break those gym memberships. It's a cash flow business. That's unfortunate. Um, there's a lot of businesses that you're going to see online when you start research, researching different uh, fitness gurus online. And, and I actually came across one this morning as I was preparing for this talk, and, and I thought it was a fantastic website. Um, and it was, it was called My Fitness Geek, and it was a YouTube video, and he had lots of great advice. And then he got to one part where he talked about aerobic exercise, and he, he just went on about how you know this is the worst thing for losing weight. You need to be doing hip routines. And I thought, what about those people out there who have different outcomes in mind? How could like, people with heart conditions do a hip routine? Wouldn't that something a little more gradual be good for them? And I just saw his perspective was, was so all focused on losing weight, six pack abs, losing weight, six pack abs. It's that shiny thing that, that people seem to want. That's not the solution to health and happiness. You know, I will tell you right now, my wife will trade the gut that I have for six pack abs if I can hang around for another 30 or 40 years and be healthy. Right? I mean, you don't have to be perfect. That's not the that's not the end goal here. But this perspective almost killed me. And so what happened was I decided about well, when you get news like that, what do you do? What would you normally do if your doctor said you got to lose some weight to get in shape? What would you do? Well, I have a little bit of a go through everything in the house and throw everything out. Of Wrong answer. I did nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Good try. I did nothing. <laughs> Most people will do nothing because what I heard was you didn't have a heart attack. Therefore, I'm no worse than anybody else. I can keep doing what everybody else is doing. 
that's what we do. So about three months later, the problems started coming back. The symptoms started coming back. I remember coming home from the superstore. And I said to my wife, oh, I've got to go for a walk. I have to go do something to sweat in a positive way and not in a negative way today. So off I went, and I went for my 5K run. I was going to do a run. Back in high school, it was easy. Yeah, went for a run. That's a road. Go for a run. That's easy. Put my running shoes on. I made it like halfway down the block and started heaving and panting and going, this is not good. And realized as I waved to my neighbors as I was going, going, yeah, I'm going for a 5K run. I'm going to go. I can't go home. Nobody wanted to I gotta sit this thing out. So, so here I go. I get had this, this 5K map rooted out. And I, I did the 5K map. And I did a little walk, a little run, a little walk, a little run. And, and it really took about three weeks to get to the point where I could actually run 3K. But something changed that day. See, I stopped looking at the scale. I made a decision that I was no longer going to chase a scale and chase pounds of stuff. Put that away. I said, I'm going to invest in myself today. That's what I'm going to do. So what happened was, I did three things here. This is the three things that are going to be your takeaway message for today. I created a new vision for myself. I decided I was going to be that guy who we all see in our neighborhood walking around every day and go, good on him. He walks every day. I see that guy all the time. I was going to become that guy. That was my vision. I was going to be that guy. And I also decided that I was not going to let chronic disease be for uh, ruin my life and dictate my life, I was going to win every single day. If I went out and invested in my heart, by my diet, my exercise, then I too would feel like a winner every day. And the last thing is about feeling empowered. Well, when you feel empowered in what you're doing, when you have better answers to the questions that you have, you start developing confidence and confidence in what you're doing. When these three things come into play, all of a sudden your world will start to change. So let's explore these in a little more detail. Uh, new vision. So right off the bat, doctor tells me I gotta lose weight and get in shape, get this piece of paper that says eat these foods. So I think, okay, I'm gonna eat nothing but vegetables. I'm gonna go for a walk every day, and of course I'm gonna sleep better because I'm eating well and I'm moving well. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> you get hungry, I would just talk about who's been on a diet for 30 days and wants to chew their arm off. You know, real life gets in the way. You start going to withdrawals. Um, and you don't necessarily sleep because maybe you're working 80 hours a day, maybe your sleep patterns, your sleep hygiene is off, you don't even know what sleep hygiene is, and, and all of these things are, are contributing to you having poor quality of life. If you don't get enough sleep, you make poor food choices. If you don't get enough sleep, you make bad choices at work because your mental capacities aren't working the way they should be. Uh, there is just so much neuroscience. I'm not here to go into all that today, but my point is, by creating a new vision for yourself, there's lots of information for you to find and lots of information to discover as we go through the process of becoming, finding health and happiness for your life. Now, how we communicate this vision to ourselves is very important. Has anybody here in the room heard of Simon Sinek? A few people? Yes. Awesome. So Simon Sinek is probably one of the top uh, business gurus or business uh, consultants uh, in the world. And he's a communication specialist, and he came up with this, this rocket science here. It's called the Golden Circle. And uh, it's basically how we communicate with ourselves and how we communicate with other people. This is how most people who are challenged by diet and exercise think. They say they work from the outside to the inside, the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. They say things like, what do you want to do? I want to lose 10 pounds. I can do it. I'm going to go on a diet or go to the gym. Why can I do it? Because my wife wants me to. My doctor told me I had to. Right? You're not doing it. I'm not doing it because I, I want to do it. You know, I'll, I'll do it because I'm being told to do it, but I'm not going to be happy about it. Anybody ever feel like that? No? Does anybody here like being told what to do? No. <laughs> 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 Trick question. <laughs> right, none of us like being told what to do. But think about it. Remember when we, we talk about why we stop doing things? If you're if you're wise because somebody else is telling you to do it, as soon as the scale doesn't show you the outcome that you're looking for, if you're not managing that outcome properly, as soon as you don't see the numbers you're looking for, you quit. It's a cycle of quitting and it's always worked that way. But let's reverse this. Let's start with why. Well, I want to have better quality of life as I grow older, period. There's no end date to that, right? There's no, there's no 10 pounds and then I'll consider my options. It's I want to enjoy my best possible quality of life today and every day moving forward. Yeah. Did you guys ever see WKRP in Cincinnati's yeah. yeah. You remember the one episode where Johnny Fever was with the state trooper and he was the more he drank, the faster he got on the reflex machine? It's like, it's not supposed to work that way. Well, health and wellness actually works that way when you start investing in yourself every day. I was just think that that one analogy, so I'm glad you remember that. But I always say to myself, why am I doing this? Because I want to have my best possible quality of life moving forward. 
How is that going to happen? I'm going to do activities that make my heart sing, that I love doing, and I'm going to pay attention while I'm doing this so that I get the benefits that I want to have. What's going to be the end result? I'm going to enjoy doing youthful activities with my kids for the rest of my life and their kids. So when you think about your why and your vision, understand it's going to constantly change. You're going to go from that guy who was walking the neighborhood to incredible other things because as you do more, your belief system will start to change with you. So let's talk about really quickly um, winning the day. This was a really big one for me. Uh, this is a t-shirt I actually had made uh, 11 years ago when I started my journey. Now I actually put it on the floor in the morning. When I got up and didn't want to work out in the morning, I woke up and I saw my t-shirt and says, today I win, I will finish what I start, I will reach my goal. It was my self mantra that I used at self-talk that kept me going. And this is a friend of mine, Michael, um, whose daughter also danced with my daughter. And I didn't know Michael very well 11 years ago, but Michael was a runner. And he was a half marathon runner, and actually a marathon runner. And he heard that I was starting this new fitness journey. And he heard that I had just run a 5K race. I did the rank and run, which was my first uh, 5K 11 years ago or so. And, and, and I remember being at the race and hearing these runners go, well, that was fun, let's go for a run. And I'm like, you just ran that 5K. <laughs> Come on, we, we got to lie down and get some nervous <laughs> or something, right? <laughs> um, my, my mindset was completely off. And Mike said to me, well, there's this race coming up in Guernsey called the Guernsey Beach by the 10th day. Let's go do that one. And I said, but Michael, I've never run that far before in my life. And he said, Dave, just go out. You're running 5K every day now. And I literally ran every day for three years. I did not stop running. And that's a mistake, by the way, a lesson learned. But Mike told me, he said, if you're running 5K now, just mix in a couple of 7K runs twice a week. And when that race comes up in three months, you'll easily be able to do 10K. And on race day, I remember very vividly being behind the Grimsley High School. We had about the 7K marker there, thinking like, I might die. Like, I don't know what's, I don't know what's over there, right? Like, and then, then 8 came along, then 9 came along, then 10 was like, holy crap, I can do this thing. So that was a picture taken right after the race, and I, I just couldn't believe how I felt, how, how my, my perception of what was possible had changed. That's why I also learned that the fitness community really is a community. These are like-minded people who you start to see other people who are on the same journey as you, who you can maybe emulate. Maybe you see somebody and meet a friend who's living the life you want to be living and go, how can I learn from that person? Maybe I'm going to hang around that person where Michael's actually become one of my closest friends now. But it's this idea of winning the day, and I always sort of relate finances when I talk to people in banks about fitness and wellness. There's a really neat correlation between the two. It's basically the same as dollar cost averaging. When you're planning your finances for your future, if you stop investing every day, you won't have nest egg when you're done. But if you look at investing in yourself every day, just make that daily investment and good things start to happen. Your fitness starts to go up, and all of a sudden you can experience things you never thought possible. So this is the notion that you want to look at every day as not necessarily I want to go out and, and, and climb that massive mountain. Today I'm going to go out and do something really positive for myself so that I can be in a position to climb that mountain when the day comes. The last thing I want to talk about with empowerment, this is a, a client of mine, Camille, and, and I think Rachel might know Camille. Uh, Camille was a fitness client of mine. She's, uh, her husband and her um, run a dental practice here in the city. And, and Camille listened to my story about becoming an Ironman. Now I'm going to say Camille's age was between, let's put her first age, was between 50 and 70, if they'll give me her age. And Camille came up to me and said, Dave, I'm totally inspired by what you're doing. I've got a lot of crap going on in my life right now, and I need something to feel good about. And so I sat down with Camille, and we came up with a plan. And I said, I'm going to help you do a triathlon. She said, I want to, I want to do a triathlon. I said, well, what level do you want to do? And uh, she said, I want to do a triathlon. So I said, fair enough. A triathlon means you're going to go up here and swim 250 meters. You're going to ride your bike to 5K, and then you're going to do a 2K run. Simple enough. Now, having her go through that process and, and, and having somebody believe in you before you actually believe you can do it yourself is hugely important. So if you can surround yourself with people who believe you believe, all of a sudden good things will start to happen. Now this feeling of empowerment, well, how does that happen? How do you feel confident and confident every day in what you're doing? There's so much misleading information out there. Well, it turns out that there are three questions you need to be able to ask yourself if you're going to be self-motivated. The first one is, can you do it? And do you believe you can do what you're setting out to do? Belief is huge. Um, when I started, I believed I could go out for a walk, and that's what I did. 
But as I got into my program, and like I said, I was three years into my program, actually what happened was I was out for a run one day and I ran into a gentleman on the bike. He was, his name actually was Dr. Rosenberg. I later, later met him a couple years ago, a couple years after I met him the first time. And uh, Dr. Rosenberg was a pedag podiatrist, what's the doctor? Yeah. Podiatrist in the city here. And uh, he said to me, Dave, he spent five minutes with me, he changed my life. Now, here's something important for leaders in the room. Have the courage to speak up and ask questions and be humble enough to listen. So I had the courage to speak up and talk to Dr. Rosenberg and say, hey, have you really done that Iron Man thing? I'm out for a run, I see a guy wearing an Iron Man bike and he's waiting for his bike to climb up a hill. So I talked to him and he said, hey, he said, yeah, I've done this a couple of times. And he said, I used to be just like you. I used to just run because I had a heart, a heart condition as well. And he said, uh, what I found was that if I have two other sports to, to fall back on, then I, if I, if I get hurt running, I'll be able to continue this journey. So I said, okay, that's interesting. I didn't think much of it. I still didn't want to be an Ironman. But that fall, I became a bit of a baby. When it got wet outside and cold, I didn't like running outside anymore. I, I got a treadmill. And I remember being in the house, uh, another chance meeting, on my treadmill, I turned the TV on the Ironman was on TV. And I'm watching the guy on TV run. And he's running and I'm running on the treadmill. And I think, well, how hard can that? He can run, I can run. He can swim, I can swim. I had a pool growing up, I didn't drown. Right? Uh, he rode a bike. I can ride a bike. I'm pretty sure. So, so I got up the I got off the treadmill and I went into my office. And I found the closest Ironman to me. It was called Ironman 70.3 in Muskoka. Had no idea what that meant. I just signed up for it. It cost me nine hundred dollars. <laughs> then I had to book three nights at Deerhurst Hotel, another thousand dollars. Within five minutes, I decided I was going to become an Ironman. I spent two thousand dollars. I hadn't told my wife. <laughs> so I called my wife Robin into the office. I said, Robin, come and see what I just did. And I remember very vividly her coming into the office and I turned the computer around and said, I'm going to be an Iron Man. And she said, What? I said, I'm going to be an Iron Man. And she said, You're an idiot. <laughs> but after she got that chuckle on her way, she said, But you know what? I believe in you. And if I get to go to Deerhurst for the weekend, I'm in. <laughs> right? So I got this great picture of her by the liquor store in Deerhurst <laughs> in Huntsville. But the, the point is this, she said she believed in me. And when you start out in this process of self-motivation, how are you self-motivated to do something every day? You have to believe you can do it. Now, if you decided, if Camille had come to me and said, I want to do an Ironman, I would have said to her, you know what, keep that really close to your chest, don't share that with everybody else. But your desire to go out and do a, a try a try is awesome. And, and we're gonna start, people will see you walk, because you can walk through the run, you can ride a bike, you can do a little swim, People believe in that. If you're in an office and you say, I'm going to run a marathon, Dan, if you're going to run a marathon, people are going to look at you and go, yeah, great, good for you, Dan, but you know, we've never seen you run before. It's kind of bad for you. And when you quit, there's donuts in the office. Come on over to the dark side again. But that's the sort of support that we get. But if you think of it in terms of, I want to run a marathon, and I'm going to keep that sort of tight up here. And I tell my coworkers, I'm going to start walking a bunch of day. I'm going to do something good for myself. I'm going to win the day today. They're going to say, hey, good on you. I've seen you walk before. That might be good. And you know what? They'll see you walk for a couple of weeks and they might say, hey, I might join you. That looks like a fun thing you're doing. And all of a sudden, you've got people talking in the community that starts to grow. And as that community grows, you start changing your perspective. One day, the next day, you own a spin studio. You know what? Just things <laughs> happen. Inside joke. Uh, that did happen, actually. Uh, so the first question is do you believe what you're setting up to do? Do you believe you can do it? The second question is will my recipe work? So this is important, and I'm going to put my phone down to share this one with you. Um, I want to talk about critical mistake analysis because as you go through your journey into wellness, you will always have, depending on where you are in that journey, a different perspective on where you are and what you want to accomplish. So this is you can use this in work, you can use this in diet, exercise, planning a race in Ironman. This works all the time. And I learned this from the IELTS training industry. Uh, if you take critical mistake analysis and you put outcome over here, okay, so we all have in mind what we want the end result to be, okay? If we put our mistakes on the list and we say cost, we say frequency, and we say trainability in the three ages, okay, let me explain this. I'll explain this with a story. 
So when I went to do my first Ironman in 2011, um, I was 45 years old, and I had trained probably at that point for seven years to get myself to the point where I had actually physically completed an Ironman race. And there were a number of mistakes that I could have made. Now, at the same time, I'm going to meet a gentleman by the name of Mark Westcott from Buffalo, who was also 45 at the time, uh, was packing up his two teenage sons and his wife to head down to Louisville to do the same race. And in Louisville, when we got there, um, I'll do a little map here just to give you a better visual description. In Louisville, what happens is, the start of the race, there's a long dock like this and a bunch of slips. And it's a narrow river that opens up into the Ohio River. So the idea is you line up in the big line, come down the dock, line up in the big line as athletes. It's not one of those mass starts where like 2,000 people jump in the water at once. One by one, you come through this line, you come down the dock, you jump in the water, and you start swimming. So right here on the dock is the Shores Boathouse. And by the time I got here, and I'm going like this, the race is already maybe five minutes old, there's lots of people in the water, and I see a sheriff's deputy freaking out, and he's running towards shore. And I'm thinking, okay, there's something going on up in the park, I don't know, it's got nothing to do with me, I'm gonna be an Ironman today. <laughs> and I got into the water, went run down the dock, got into the water, jumped into the water, and as I got to right about here, there are paddle boards all along this waterway, and you're allowed to reach onto the paddle board if you're having a panic attack. It's, it's, it's totally legal. Um, you're not advancing yourself forward in the race, so it's totally fine. And as I was swimming by that point, I noticed there were a whole bunch of people holding on to these paddle boards, thinking to myself, what a bunch of dummies. They didn't train properly, they weren't used to the open water, a million things are going through your head, but you're thinking, you know, I got hit in the chest by, by a piece of rebar on the water right up there, and the water was so brown and murky, I could see my hand in front of my face, it was about that color right there. It was 84 degrees, so no wetsuits to, to help with buoyancy. It was gross. I'll never swim the Ohio River again. <laughs> um, but the point is this. There was a problem here. And, and after I got past that point, my wife said they actually stopped the race to get a racer out of the water. And then they started the race again. And it was only two days later when I was home that I heard from my friend Lou. He said, hey, I heard you were in that race. Is that where that guy from Buffalo died? And I went, what are you talking about? I had no idea. As an athlete, they didn't tell you somebody died in the race. Um, Mark actually passed away in the race. He actually, uh, they thought he drowned. It was actually a massive heart attack he had right there, and then they pulled him out of the water. Now, let's go back and have a look at this. Critical mistake analysis. When I read the national media uh, report on this, they said, it's, you know, it's an amazing thing, these endurance athletes. They are weekend warriors. They go out and they don't know they have an underlying heart condition and they try to do these activities. It's unsafe. You shouldn't do it. And I thought, what a negative thing to say. You just discouraged how many people from ever going out and trying one of the most amazing experiences of their life. But upon further investigation, I read a Buffalo News article where they actually interviewed the father, the interviewed Mark's father. And I'm going to list a couple of mistakes that, that could have been made, and then I'm going to tell you what Mark's dad said. So when you're doing open water swimming, for example, you've got to swim 4K in that race. So one of the mistakes you could make is maybe you don't swim 4K, maybe you only swim 3K and you don't make the time cut off. That could be a mistake. Maybe you don't practice sighting, which means that you might swim off course and not make the finish line. Maybe you don't practice swimming in groups where you're not used to being swam over or being punched and kicked by feet on a purpose, but it happens. And then I read this article from Mark's dad, and he gave two very important clues. He said, although Mark was an accomplished athlete, and although Mark um, had to do all the training, this was Mark's first triathlon. Hmm, first triathlon's an Ironman, okay? That's an interesting clue. First try. He also said, although Mark was an accomplished swimmer, he hated open water swimming. This was Mark's first open water swim. All that open water. Now, critical mistake analysis. What does this look like? Well, this pen works. There's another one there. So, if we look at these three items here, this is cost, this is frequency, and this is trainability. So, what is the cost of this mistake? If you only swim 3K in your training, right? All of a sudden, you might fizzle out a little bit, and you might have a slow time. Uh, is that a low cost? Yeah, that's low. That doesn't mean I'm going to have severe, uh, major consequence. So we'll call that low. Sighting, yeah, make it off course, might take me a little bit longer. That's low. Yeah, this cross. 
Uh, swimming in groups, I might get my, my goggles kicked off. Uh, that would be problematic. We'll call that a medium one because that's that could be a problem and issue in the water if you can't get your goggles cleared out. First triathlon, what could happen in a triathlon? Guess what, people die, right? So we're gonna call this one the first triathlon, never been doing a triathlon before picking an island. That's a high consequence uh, if, if things go wrong. Never open water swimming before. That's high because you don't learn how to do panic attack recovery. If you don't know how to do those things, you might have a panic attack, not catch your breath, you might have a heart attack in the water, which is exactly what happened here. So what's the frequency of this event? What are the frequency of these mistakes? Well, maybe you only swim 3K, uh, three days a week, and two days a week you actually do swim four. Okay, we're gonna call that a low frequency, not very high. Sighting, yeah, you know what, you should practice it more, but it's kind of a low activity as well. Swimming in groups, if you don't do it enough, we're gonna call that one a medium one. First triathlon, frequency, not having practiced doing a triathlon before, bad mistake, that's a high consequence. Not ever trying to do any open water swimming, that's a high consequence. Now, trainability, can this problem be fixed with training? It can't fix stupid. Let's just remember that. So that would be a low trainability. If, if you're the type of person who goes off, a guy did this a couple years ago, um, his swim buddies, Back in infant night, he decided to go over a couple of kilometers swim. In a wetsuit, in a perfectly clear night, caught a wave of water, got into his lungs, and even though he got a wetsuit on, it's very buoyant, down to the bottom of the lake, he might drown. So, you know, when I look at consequences, you can't train stupid. All the training in the world, all the good stuff he could have done, wouldn't have fixed the decision he made that night to go swim by himself. So, when I think of these things, consequences or trainability, I think, you know, is it a stupid thing and they're just not going to learn it, or is it something that training could actually fix? So 3K, you know, is it stupid? No. Is it something that's fixable? Sure, I can probably fix that. Sighting, is that something that's fixable? Sure it is. That's, that's obviously, we're going to call that high, because I can fix that one easy. Swimming in groups, get in a group or swim, easily fixed. Uh, first triathlon, hey, do a few beforehand in your training, it used to be the idea, and probably can eliminate that as a risk. So that's high trainability. Open water swimming, do enough of it, you get comfortable in it, high trainability. So when you look at the three H's, which one of these have three H's? Both, here and here. These are the two critical mistakes that Mark made, okay? These are the two reasons why Mark passed away that day. His outcome was to become an Ironman. He didn't experience the outcome because there was a problem in his training. So when you apply this methodology to your diet, to your exercise, I'm going to share with you how we can apply that in a second in a more practical way. But I wanted to share this example with you because this is something that the, um, the training industry uses globally. It's critical mistake analysis. It is a very powerful tool to look at what you're doing, what are the mistakes I'm making, how critical are they, and am I actually going to get the outcome that I wanted, or am I just wishing that I'll get that outcome? Okay, this is an important step. And then the last thing in here is, is the effort really worth it? And I'll tell you, you can look at this picture of Camille, you can make whatever judgments you want to make, but on that day, Camille was healthier than she'd ever been. She was totally empowered. She was in a place where she was in control of her life. And I would take this person in a heartbeat and go anywhere with her because that's the kind of people that I want to associate myself with. So they don't have to have six-pack abs, but if they're on a journey and they feel confident and confident in what they're doing and they feel empowered, those are the type of people who you want to associate with because those are the type of people who are going to get you to where you want to go. Just like when I became a triathlete, I made a whole new circle of friends. People who believed in me way before I believed in myself. And, you know, it was awesome. So, why does any of this matter? Um, when I ask people, how do you want to die? What an interesting question. Luke, you may not have thought about this stuff uh, because you're younger. But as people who are maybe a little bit older, we ask ourselves, like, what, how do you want to check it out? What's, what's the best way to go? Flames off a cliff? Uh, you know, what, how do you want to do this thing? And most people will say, I want to go out in my sleep. Nice and calm, peaceful, you know. Well, here's, here's reality. Uh, how many people here know anybody with a chronic disease? Anybody? Know anybody? Okay. Uh, so here's the thing. This is the leading causes of death in North America. You can see that going peacefully in your sleep isn't even on my chart. 10% um, are alcohol and car accidents, because it's not very many plane accidents. Uh, accidents cause 10% of deaths. The rest of these are all chronic diseases. And, you know, why should perspective matter to you? Because it's going to be part of your life. 
more likely than not. And if it's not going to affect you, it's going to affect somebody in your life. And we need to start having a discussion as a population, conversations amongst ourselves as to how we can help change this problem. Now, this is why it matters to me. Um, this is my father, Murray, who passed away in April um, at 74 from Alzheimer's and dementia. His mother, uh, my grandmother, passed away uh, at West Park Nursing Home in her 70s from Alzheimer's and dementia. So I'm standing here going, okay, uh, I'm next in line. I don't like the looks of this. Uh, best time I get, some, better I get some information right now. And as my dad was going through uh, his journey with his neurologist and we were taking his appointments, um, I would, the, the neurologist would ask us, do you have any questions? And without giving her my whole backstory, I would just say, yes, how do I not end up like this? And one critical thing she said to me was, um, crosswords are for entertainment, and exercise is brain food. And that's all she said. And I took it upon myself to do some research and find something out. Does anybody here have anybody in their family affected by Alzheimer's dementia? Okay, so here's, here's the reality. Here are the facts that you can look up. 1% of cases is hereditary. 1%. 99% of Alzheimer's and dementia, like most current diseases, are lifestyle problems. And what do we learn from our families? We look at our parents and our grandparents and we do the same stuff. We see the same sort of outcomes, so we follow the same sort of patterns. Our vision, our perspective has to start changing. That's why it's so important to find somebody in your life who you aspire to be. <laughs> the neatest thing for me when I did my first Ironman, my half Ironman, that 70.3 in Muskoka, was I, I it took me, uh, and I'll back the story up a second, it, I started my wave in that race to swim ahead of another gentleman. He was in the age group behind me. He was older than me, he was 65. Somewhere in the water he passed me, stayed ahead of me on the bike, and three quarters of the way through the run, I caught up to him. And in the Iron or in any Iron Man, the track on the right your age of your back, back of your right path. And as I'm running up to this guy, it dawned on me, this is the same age as my dad. And look what he's doing when my dad's in a wheelchair. What 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 happened here? And I, I ran out and I put my hand on his shoulder and said, Hey man, I don't know who you are, but I just want to thank you because you've just changed my perspective of what 65 is supposed to look like. And we had a really good chuckle. And throughout the rest of my journey, I, I, I did a program with high school students, and we'll see a picture of that uh, soon enough, where I actually went out and took 30 STEM bus to high schools every day. And I did programs in schools with the kids. And, and I said, my wish is that when I'm 65 or 75 or 85, if you remember me and you're doing one of these crazy things, come up with your hand on my shoulder and say thank you, because that will just make my day. And I actually had one of those kids come up to me, uh, I'm not that old yet, uh, last year in Wellman, and, and say, I remember you, Mr. Bazanko, I remember you. And she came over to introduce herself. She was a rower from the city as well. And uh, yeah, it was, it's an amazing experience. But this is why it matters to me, is because false information. Last night, did anybody watch CTV News last night? Where they announced that 500,000 people in Canada currently have Alzheimer's and dementia. And the toll that that's taking not only on them, but their caregivers, which are their primary families. Okay? I've watched this destroy lives. And I can tell you, why don't they talk about fixing the problem before it becomes a problem? Why is it always waiting for the government to create a solution or a new paper or a study or donate some money to provide some support? Why don't we fix the problem where it starts and talk about how we can make some positive changes? So why should any of you care about this? You've seen people like this around wandering the streets or kids. Some of you have them, some of you have seen them, some of you know some. But guess what? They're watching you, right? You guys are watching your parents. You may not want to agree with now, but you will become just like your parents. <laughs> <laughs> you will follow their behaviors. It's, it's terrible. I know. It's sort of burst your bubble. Sorry, Dan. That's how he is. But look, these kids, these kids need positive role models in their life because here's the thing if you don't care about your health and happiness, if you don't display that as proof of what you do every day, if, if you say, I believe that, that you know, growing old, healthy, happy it is what I believe I should be able to enjoy. If everything you do doesn't serve as proof of what you believe, the kids are not stupid. They'll see that, right? If you want to change that that lifestyle behavior in your families, you've got to start demonstrating that this is important to you in, in the things that you do. Mm -hmm. So, what hasn't worked in the past? Changing, chasing patterns, right? 
right? Chasing cows is gone. I threw my scale away a long time ago. I know that you're doing a challenge right now and that you're tracking things on a scale. That's fine. I wouldn't discourage you from doing that, but what I would say to you is when you lose the 10 pounds, the 20 pounds, the 50 pounds, whatever it's going to be, then what? You have to have a different motivation beyond just losing the weight. If your vision is, and I'm going to share my, my current vision with you right now, is I believe that every parent, every family in Canada and in North America should be able to sit down with their kids and have an informed, intelligent conversation around the dinner table about food and exercise. Not based on thinking this is great and thinking that's great, an actual intelligent conversation. That happens in my house, and I can tell you it does not happen in any of my kids' friends' houses because it's not a topic of conversation. We'd rather do what I did before, which is stick my head in the sand and pretend it's not going to happen to me. Right? It does require some effort, but not the kind of effort you think. This is a great trick that we learned uh, to, to manipulate the scale. Uh, anybody that's ever rode in the city or wrestled where you've got to make weight, yeah. the old garbage bag runs, right? The health industry knows how to take 10 pounds off you. I can take 10 pounds off you in an hour. You take our bag and let's go, right? <laughs> this is not sustainable health and happiness, guys. This is just a short-term fix to, to, to either win a competition or make weight, make weight, right? It's craziness. This is this is something really important. Sean Aker, does anybody here know who Sean Aker is? He wrote a book called The Happiness Advantage. Okay, so Sean cleared something up for me. I'm a big fan of TED Talks, by the way. Uh, I, I found a lot of those talks really help make that puzzle look a lot clearer. But Sean talks, about, he's a Harvard professor who talks about health and happiness, one of the most popular classes on, the, on campus at Harvard. And- uh, Talk about the TED Talks, right? TED Talks? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in his book, he came up with a statement that makes so much sense to me. You know, he said, in life, what we do is we relate success to happiness. We say, when I'm successful, I'll be happy. When I lose 10 pounds, I'll be happy. What your brain does, it goes, okay, I lost 10 pounds, now I'll lose another 10. Or from, in my case, and I'll show you in a second my, my racing examples, um, when I got to where I thought was the happiness state, it was, it was, okay, that was good, but what's next? You never allow your brain to get the happiness. What you're experiencing is momentary pleasure. So what Sean said was, he stole this from the ancient Greeks, he said their definition of happiness was, um, we need to define happiness as the joy we feel while striving for our full potential every day. And if you think of it in that terms, what am I doing every day? I'm trying to win the day. And I feel so good about myself and confident about myself before my work day even starts. I work up in the morning, and when 9 o'clock rolls around, I've already won. Everything else is great. And when you come from that perspective, if you try to work it at the end of the day, you can get it if you'd like to, but it's kind of like saving and saying, at the end of the month, I'm going to save some money. At the end of the month, comes around, and there's no money left to save. Your, your energy levels are the same way you're in the day, right? You go to work, fight traffic, there and back, deal with your family, make dinner, you're done. Who's got the time to work out? Maybe you've got a belly full of food you don't want to work out, right? Like there's just so many things that stack up against you. If you work out in the morning, you'll have a much higher success ratio. It might suck, but I'll tell you, I've seen some really amazing sunrises, and here in Niagara, it's just spectacular. Um, so how this worked for me, so these are three Ironman finishers. And I'm going to explain something to you. The first Iron Man was all about believing that it was possible. I didn't believe, even going to Louisville, I didn't believe that I could finish that race. It's a very daunting race. It's a 4K swim, 180K on the bike, and then a 42K run. In the heat, it's a long way. It's not easy. But I did it. The second one was, okay, I'm going to do a critical mistake analysis and try to understand how I can be faster. My vision has changed from just wanting to be an Iron Man to now I want to go to Hawaii. Now I want to qualify for the World Championships. To do that, I've got to post a 10 and a half hour time. So I didn't say I can't do that, it's too fast, it's too painful. I said, how can I do that? And I started looking at my training, and I started asking better questions. And what happened was I ended up doing not 10 and a half hours, 11 and a half hours. Okay? In the 10 kilometers before the finish line, I had a major sodium cramp, which means that your body's starting to shut down. I lost too much sodium, major cramping, not good. If I'm between eight stations, which is where I was, and you're not attended to, you can die. You know, it's one of those things, you have to sign a waiver when you do these things. Um, but I brought with these salt tablets because I expected that would be part of the problem. And because I brought the salt tablets, I was able to negotiate that situation with my body on my own, and within a half an hour, I was back to running. And rather than getting a DNF, I finished in not 10 and a half, but 11 and a half hours. 
The interesting thing is, even if I had done the 10 and a half hours, there were some guys from Germany who went to the race who posted it in nine and a half hours. I wouldn't have gone anyway. You just don't know who your competition is. This is an uncontrollable thing. So why stress over things you can't control? And then here's the interesting part. Between here and here is where my father got put into a nursing home. When I was training to be the best athlete I could be, I found myself training at a very, very high heart rate zone. And I found myself uh, eating a lot of sugar to fuel the exercise that I was doing. And when I'm going out and burning six, seven, eight thousand calories a day, and I know that I'm eating really healthy 3,000 calories, I have 3,000 spare, all of a sudden the frozen yogurt looks pretty damn empty. And I would eat it because I would go, well, it's just calories, right? I'm just counting calories. What I wasn't doing was I wasn't asking good enough questions. And I wasn't trying to get the answers that I wanted to hear. What I found out was that from here to here, if I continue training the way that I was, I was not going to get these things called DDNF, those folks who have Alzheimer's in the family, brain neutral, sort of brain derived neurotrophic factors. You get that when you work out aerobically. You don't get that when you work out subaerobically or anaerobically. That is production of new brain cells in your hippocampus. Why don't we talk about that? There's plenty of science that proves that you don't get it doing hip workouts, you don't get it doing anaerobic stuff or going for a walk. But when you work out aerobically for a sustained period, you get this beautiful benefit where your brain starts to grow again. Now, for people who have this disease in their family, this became kind of a cool thing. I started reaching out and asking the experts. And I'm going to talk about one of my friends who I've met since then who wrote this book, Dr. Greg Wells from Sickness Hospital in Toronto, wonderful guy. Um, also an Ironman triathlete, we have lots in common. Um, but he references it in his book as well. That, I, I'm going to talk about that in a second. But, but what I did here was I kept changing my vision and I kept changing my recipe and I kept asking better questions and that vision kept changing. This was the most successful Ironman that I did last year at 51. And it was 12 hours an hour slower than this guy, but I was so much happier because I understood my body so much more. This guy is going to be around for another 30 years. This guy could have put himself in really great. This guy just didn't know what he was doing. He got lucky. Okay? Now, here's why perspective matters. Two weeks ago, I celebrated my 20th wedding anniversary with my wife, my wife Robin. And we celebrated by, I said to Robin, what do you want to do? It was two Saturdays ago. She says, I want to go for a 10K show run. Music to my ears. I'm living beside the short hills to hear my wife, who's not athletic, who's never done athletic things in her life, who watched me go through this journey and about uh, six years ago, met Rachel, maybe about, maybe about six years ago. Uh, she decided that she didn't want to be left behind. She realized this was a lifestyle change, it wasn't going away. I remember friends of hers saying, Yeah, it's a phase, they didn't get over it. You know, it's just let them have his fun, it'll, it'll go away. It didn't go away. And she got tired of sitting on the sidelines. So she started doing hip workouts and she started spinning on a spin bike and she started doing a little bit of running and down doing a bunch of things, which led to a lot of really interesting conversations about food and exercise, which our kids got to listen to. And you know, even though we don't always agree on doing the same things, remember you've got to do what you love. She loves hip workouts, I do not. I love swimming, biking, and running. So find what you love to do, do it happily, and then have really intelligent conversations about it. You will find that your peer group around you will start to develop those same sort of habits. So what was really cool about this is I posted this picture on Facebook and immediately got people in Toronto who I'd never met before, saw this post from when we just celebrated our 20th anniversary today too. I went for a 10K run. How cool is that? I mean, like, like we're in such a fortunate position, but it's, it's taken time to get there. It didn't, we didn't get the bodies that we have overnight. It took us a lifetime to get to here. It's gonna take time to get to where we wanna go. All right, so here's what you can do. As leaders, as parents, as coaches, or any other activities you might do with kids, teach kids to ask better questions. I took it upon myself to go and buy 30 spin bikes and buy a trailer and a truck and pull them around. I took it upon myself to go talk to the school board and say, I have a message that I want to share with these kids that I don't think they're getting. And I offended a lot of gym teachers because they went, who are you? You don't have a teaching degree. You shouldn't be in here telling these kids what's what. Do you think these kids were interested? These kids were more than interested. And I was able to connect with these kids on a level of those teachers and never connected with them on. And it's an amazing thing if we teach kids, don't tell them what to do, inspire them to ask better questions. So two years ago, my son Warren comes home 
and he's got a bag, and inside the bag is pop tarts. <laughs> like, I mean, come on, pop tarts. But at this point in my journey, we're like nine years in, how can you bring that crap up? Really? He says, Dad, I, I, I fell into the marketing. He says, you know, water down pop tarts, how would that be a bad thing? <laughs> so I bought them, and I brought them home, and I said, okay, I sat there for a second, I said, okay, how many grams of sugar per serving? He went, 21. I said, how many grams of sugar can your body handle today? He gave me a number, and this could be a test for you guys in a second. I said, okay, he knows the number his body can handle, and he knows how many is in the package. I taught him how to make an informed choice. Now it's on him, right? All we can do as parents is teach our kids how to make an informed choice and demonstrate through our own behaviors what we believe is important. And if we do those things, they might stand a chance. So, quick question, the first person who can answer this question, how many grams of sugar, and I'll give you a clue, World Health Organization, and on your phone right now, how many grams of sugar can the human body handle in a day? 24. I heard the answer. 24 grams. This is for you. <laughs> I, this this, this part is life changing. Um, you know, my journey is not the same as yours. I, I'm a different kind of guy. I get into sports. I love athletics. And most people will never do an Ironman. I get it. Um, but. Greg is a doctor at Sick Kids Hospital, uh, very, very uh, well sought after keynote speaker for many organizations globally. He wrote this book called The Ripple Effect. When we went for a bike ride, you'll see on YouTube, if you search my YouTube channel, we went for a ride in Scarborough and just had a great conversation for two hours talking about the challenges that we had in our life, the challenges that people have. And he said, Dave, I'm just writing this book right now, I'm about to release it called The Ripple Effect. And, and the thing is, people don't realize that if we just look at our sleep or diet or exercise, our relationships, and we just make one percent improvements over time. The gains, the aggregate gains of that one percent are phenomenal, and it will make such a large impact. We need to stop looking for six, six pack abs and start being like Camille, finding empowerment in the things that we are doing, building that confidence. You never know where it's going to take you from one year to ten years down the road. If it's not a sustainable activity, you'll stop after 30, 30 days or, or, or when this challenge is done in a year. You know, if there's a weight goal attached to it. But if you say, no, I'm going to create a new vision for myself. In my life, I'm going to be that person who the kids in the neighborhood look up to, because every day they're going to demonstrate, or I'm going to demonstrate to where I believe that going for a walk your neck is important. Maybe going for a run is important. Maybe going for a bike ride is important. And, and maybe eating real food is important. When your kids bring their friends over, say, hey, how many grams of sugar in that thing there? What? <laughs> and then have a conversation. You know, by asking better questions, is love that you guys are curious. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is how this is how you make an impact on kids and how you make an impact on the world. Start asking better questions and demanding better answers. Uh, this is a picture that the um, uh, Clean Heart Association put out um, in the Mad campaign a couple years ago. And, and it just it, it demonstrates who does this idea benefit? Well, uh, I can tell you for the last 10 years, this was my family and my mom and my dad. Okay. I'm committed not to seeing that be my reality. I'm committed to this being my future with my wife and my, and my kids. And, and, and it's a choice. But you need, it's not as simple as saying just go and do it. It is looking at the things that you're doing every day and saying, why does this matter? Can I do it? Will it work? Is it work? Keep asking yourself those questions. And keep doing the critical mistake analysis on what you're doing. Because what you're doing may not be taking you to where you want to go. Right? So you have to keep thinking about asking better questions all the time. Um, so again, just to kind of review these key points, please take the time to sit down and create a new vision for your life. It sounds something like, I want to see this. A vision is something we can picture in our minds, right? I, it, it, when you say, I want to lose 10 pounds, right? Big deal. I want to enjoy my best possible quality of life. I want to go hiking in the mountains of Italy on my 80th birthday with my wife. That's a vision. I can see it, and everything that I do from here to that day forward is going to serve as proof that that's what I want to do, right? I've got neighbors who volunteer their time in Nepal. He's a dentist, and every day they go to the hydro hill by my house over by Broad, and they walk up and down the hydro hill because when they get to Nepal, they're at a higher elevation than you can walk on. And every day they serve as proof of what they believe their vision will be. I see them every day. It's amazing, and everybody in the neighborhood sees them. We need leaders like that in our lives. We need to be those leaders who we wish we had. Always remember to focus on today. Don't worry about a month, two months, a year from now. 
Find a recipe that you believe is going to work, keep asking questions, and feel like a winner every single day. And then the last one, empowerment, self-motivation. Can I do it? Will it work? Is it worth my time and effort? If you can answer yes to those questions, you are well on your way to becoming the person that you always wished you could be. And just to close, um, this is a picture of my two kids when they were younger up on Malcolm Park. I always finish the talk with this statement. Um, your kids are watching you. They're going to grow up to be just like you, so be the person you want them to be. If you can use that as your own personal mantra, I think as parents and as adults, uh, we're going to change the world together. So hopefully, you know, that meant something to you guys today. Thank you very much.